Okay, so I'm, I'm preaching on the topic of love today just because, uh, you know, Valentine's Day is around the corner on the 14th of February. Uh, I'll give you my thoughts on that day uh, in a moment. But I'm preaching basically on the topic of love. And, and obviously this is not a topic that can be covered in just one sermon. So really the focus of this sermon is really just comparing how the world tells us what love is and, and what we really should think what love is and how we can practically love in our life as opposed to listening to what the world tells us or maybe what we've grown up with you know we may not even realize that we have misconceptions about love so what is love we don't really have to wonder what love is because we can go to God's word we can go to God's eternal word where he tells us exactly what love is and he actually defines it in several places but I'll go to uh, just a few and this is the first one we'll start at because this, is, I, I believe, is one of the clearest. <laughs> In 2 John 1 verse 5, it says, Now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee. So 2 John is a letter that's written to an, an older uh, lady that <laughs> the Apostle John is writing to. Not, uh, I wrote a new not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. So he wants us to love each other in the church. And this is love. So we get a definition here. This is love that we walk after his commandments. Whose commandments? God's commandments, right? This is the commandment that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. So what is love according to the Bible? Love... Now, a lot of people have different ideas about what love is, and I'm going to go through all those in this sermon. But love, according to God, is keeping His commandments, right? Walking after His commandments. If we keep God's commandments, if we are obedient to His word, that is how we love. And today, you know, a lot of people call this hate. Don't they? Don't they? Like a lot of people, when you, when you want to keep God's word, when you want to obey God's word, the word defines that as hate as opposed to love. You know, if you think homosexuality should be wrong or adultery should be wrong, you know, that, that abortion is murder, they call this hate speech. But according to the Bible, is this hate speech? No, this is love speech, right? Because we're loving people by obeying God's word, by teaching them God's word, what is right and wrong. So a lot of things, you know, even uh, this, this idea that, you know, all roads lead to Rome, that every religion is the same, that there's no difference. And, but, you know, we're different, right? Because John, J Jesus in John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And a lot of people in the world will say that this is hate speech. But no, we're loving, this is love because we're telling them the truth. We're telling them that there is only one way to heaven. When people say that it doesn't matter whether you're a Muslim, whether you're a Mormon, whether you're a Jehovah's Witness, you're still going to go to heaven. They're the ones that are hating people. They're not telling them the truth. They're deceiving them into thinking something that is not true. So love, love is when we keep God's commandments, right? When we walk after his commandments. And you know, so oftentimes people will say things like this to me. They'll say things like, yeah, but can I, can I love God and, and not have to go to church? I mean, can I love God and like, I don't have to read the Bible. I mean, can I love God and not go soul winning? Can I love God, you know, and, and, and not have to pray to him all the time? Well, no, you can't. Well, you can't love God if you're disobeying Him. You can't love God if you're not keeping His commandments because love is keeping the commandments. Loving other people and loving God is keeping the commandments. And I often tell people that say, you know, well, can I love God and not go to church? I often say to them, well, but if you loved God, you, you would want to go to church. You know, so so the, there is no situation where you love God and you're not in church because if you did love God, you would be at church. You would, you would be reading your Bible. You'd want to go soul winning because this is love, that we walk after his commandments. Uh, <clears throat> now love is when we do right by others, right? Because when we keep God's commandments, this is when we do the best by other people. And that, what, that is what keeping the commandments is. If we go to Matthew 22, <coughs> 35... We have somebody come to Jesus, a lawyer, says then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, 
and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So we know that the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The second is like unto it, that you love your neighbor as yourself. So we see love really is the fulfilling of the law. But look at what he says here in verse 40. He says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. See, so when we fulfill all the law and the prophets by obeying God's word, we are loving God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We are loving our neighbor as ourselves. So if we're wondering, how do I love my neighbor as myself? How do I love God? Well, it's when we keep his commandments. This is how we love. This is what love is. Now, if we uh, look at another passage in 1 John 5, 2. Now, not only is love the deeds, right, the actions, right, but it's also the attitude in which we obey God's commandments, right? So, so I guess part of obeying God's commandments is the attitude, right, because we can be partially obeying it in the sense that we might be doing something but with the wrong attitude. Look at what it says here in 1 John 5, 2. By this we know that we love the children of God. Look at this. When we love God and we and keep His commandments. So you see that there's a, there's a pattern going through the Bible where love is in line with doing God's word because love is the fulfilling of the law. On these, like Jesus said, hang all the law and the prophets. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And look at this. And His commandments are not grievous. So not only do we keep God's commandments, like does God want us to do His commandments, but He wants us to do it with the right attitude as well, you know, when we do things, that they're not grievous, that they're not hard for us to do. And this is it's not easy. It's not easy to love. I'm not saying this is an easy thing to do. I'm not saying that I've arrived either. I'm just saying this is what love is. I'm just teaching you what the Bible says. This is what we should be striving for, right? So if we're just at church grudgingly, if we're going soul winning grudgingly, if we read our Bible just because we have to, you know, we pray because we have to, we're not really loving God. You know, can't, I just don't want you to think, I love God because I do X, Y, Z, but you do X, Y, Z with the wrong attitude. Right? You do X, Y, Z and they're grievous for you. You haven't obtained the love that God has called us to love Him with and to love our fellow brothers and sisters with. And it's something that we need to reflect on, right? Because it's something we constantly should be striving forward. So it's not something that we'll ever arrive to, because perf that's perfection. But that's what we should be striving for. So it's not just the action, um, but it's also the attitude. We see here in 1 John 5, um, I'll just show you quickly as well this psalm here. <coughs> where it says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. So again, when you sing to the Lord, when you sing to God, when you come to church, are you singing with a joyful noise, right? So it's not just that you are singing, but it's that you're singing with the right attitude. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. So we see how we, we don't only serve the Lord, but we serve the Lord with gladness. Uh, let's go on. So the reason why I wanted to talk a bit about love today is because, you know, obviously Valentine's Day is coming around and, uh, you know, I, I, I personally am not a big fan of Valentine's Day. I just feel like it's another day that's marketed just so people can sell more flowers, sell more chocolates, you know, that you'll go out and eat, you might go on a holiday, you might book out a hotel. Um, you know, and, and I feel like Valentine's Day, it's like on top of so many holidays that are already there that, that the world gets you to celebrate, right? Because you've got, you know, you've got your anniversary already. Because I thought that was the day. I thought that was the day that couples celebrated their love. It's the day that you got married and every year you have your anniversary. So, but no, no, that's not enough according to the world. That's not enough to some people as well, some ladies as well. That's not enough. You've got your anniversary. Then you've got the birthday. Right? The birthday, you don't celebrate the birthday, then, then, you're, then you're coming short. Then you've got Mother's Day. You know, Mother's Day, you're going to buy gifts. Father's Day, then you've got Christmas as well. It's just, it never ends. You know, they're going to come up with other holidays to get you to buy things. And, and now, don't get me wrong, like I was preaching about money the last couple of weeks, I'm not against necessarily buying things. And this is part of love, and that's what I'm going to be talking about. But, you know, going out to eat, buying gifts, what you have to keep in mind is sometimes that money could be spent better elsewhere, you know? So that's one thing I don't really like about Valentine's Day is just people buying gifts for the sake of buying gifts because the world has created this day, 
you know, for you to buy gifts and now there's a cultural expectation and you buy into that expectation and then you're disappointed, right? When your partner, your spouse doesn't get you something. That's when you've bought into what the world wants you to, to buy in because Valentine's Day is not in the Bible. So I'm not against necessarily treating your spouse nicely. It's just do it for the right reasons. Don't just do it just because there's some holiday that tells you to do it. But the other thing I don't like about Valentine's Day is it's, it's promoted amongst unmarried people where unmarried people are celebrating Valentine's Day. What, what do unmarried people, are, why are they celebrating Valentine's Day? Or, or, or worse yet, children. I mean, I remember when I was in school and Valentine's Day came around, that you know, you, sometimes you'd have to select a Valentine's and then buy something for another girl in the class. And, and we're just sort of perpetuating this boyfriend-girlfriend culture, which shouldn't be amongst God's people. You know, like, I don't want, I don't want Simon, you know, I don't want my kids to find a Valentine's. I want them to get a job. You know, I want to get, get them get some responsibility, then they can go look for a Valentine's, Day, Valentine's when they're ready to actually get married, right? So this whole culture of, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, you know, I believe, yeah, you guys know what I feel about this, you know, I think this needs to end amongst God's people. At the very least, this is how we should teach our children. We need to know how our children ought to date, how they ought to treat the opposite gender, how they ought to go about finding a spouse so that we don't buy into what the world tries to tell us to do, where we get this boyfriend, we get this girlfriend. And I, I'm not against the word. What, what I'm against is the, the idea that just because you call somebody your girlfriend, you call somebody your boyfriend, now it's okay for you to act married. You know, the kissing, the hugging, the holding hands, the sitting close together. This is what married people do. This is not what unmarried people do. And the danger in behaving like this is obviously, you know, the fornication. But not, not only that, it's the heartache as well, where people will, you know, they'll, they'll string a girl along or they'll string a guy along. There's a lot of emotion that, that goes into this. So marriage, marriage is not a try before you buy. You know, people, you know, don't buy into this lie that you need to try before you buy. That's why you need to kiss the girl. That's why you need to sleep with the guy. Because you've got to see whether you like it to see whether or not you're, you, you know, you want to commit to this. This is not what marriage is. That's called fornication. That's not called, you know, that's called sin. Marriage is not try before you buy. Marriage, it's an all-in commitment, right? So you're not deciding to commit to somebody based on the physical intimacy, it's that physical intimacy, it's the reward of the commitment, Amen. right? You commit to somebody and that's why you get to be physically intimate with them. And there's all these problems that come along with obviously fornication, you know, ch children out of wedlock, the uncleanness. I'm not going to go into all that, but you know, we really need to, to make sure that our children and those of us who are lo looking, getting to dating age, that we do it the right way and we don't, um, you know, sin when we are looking for a spouse. Now, if you have that mindset that marriage is this commitment, then it will work. You know, you don't have to try it before you buy because if you go into marriage with the mentality that you're going to make it work, then it will work. Right? Because marriages don't just happen. Love, you know, like we see, love is keeping the commandments of God, that we walk after His commandments. It is, a, it is a choice that we make. It's not something that just happens. And you guys know, like, it's, it's not just, you don't just all of a sudden wake up one day and just fall into being obedient and walking into the Spirit. You don't have to try at all. No, it's a conscious decision they make. You have to die daily, and take up the cross, follow Him, keep the commandments. This is what love is. Love is a, is a decision that you make. And that's why if you, if you truly love your spouse, your marriage will work because you'll make it work. Because you'll decide, you'll purpose in your heart to make it work. So what are, some, what are some common misconceptions about what people think love is? And we sort of touched on it already with the whole boyfriend-girlfriend thing. Um, <laughs> one is, you know, <laughs> and I say, and, I, I, and it's not that it's not this. Uh, but the first one I want to talk about is obviously sexual desire. Right, because some people have a sexual desire towards somebody and they think that's love, right? They, they have this, 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 this lust towards somebody. But it's not that love doesn't include this sexual desire, right? Because obviously when it comes to your marriage, when it comes to spouse, you ought to have this sexual desire towards your husband or towards your wife and, and want to fulfill that desire. So it's that there is a right place for sexual desire and there is a wrong place. And we see here in 1 Corinthians 7, <coughs> verse 1, we read here, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. 
So we know here, Paul, like I guess, you know, God through Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is giving us some advice here to say, hey, it's better to just not touch a woman at all rather than to be buddy up and close with women. And obviously it doesn't mean, you know, shaking hands or patting somebody on the back or, you know, somebody is like falling off a cliff, you know, and you don't go and rescue them because it's like, don't touch a woman, right? No, no, obviously it's talking about fornication here, because we go on to verse 2. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. See, not to have his own girlfriend, and let every woman have her own boyfriend. No, no, see, the, the way you avoid fornication and the way that it's lawful that it, to then intimately touch a woman is you get a wife, you get a husband. You see how the commitment comes first, then you're able to fulfill that sexual desire. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So we know here that there is a duty from the husband and the wife to serve one another in this area. So, you know, love, one thing about sexual gratification, right, sexual desire, is love is, is sexual gratification that is to the benefit of your spouse. You'll notice here that this is not, this is not a self-serving commandment here. This commandment is not here so that there is somebody to serve you, that there's somebody to just fulfill your desires. Yes, that's part of it, but really the focus here is, is that your partner has a need and you are serving them in fulfilling that need. So, so love is sexual gratification that is to the benefit of your spouse. It's not this sexual gratification that is just self-serving or outside of marriage, because generally that's what fornication is. When boyfriends and girlfriends, when they fornicate, they are generally doing it to fulfill their own lust, right? They're not doing it out of love, because if they did it to the benefit of the other person, they would actually wait till they're married. Why? Because this is love, that we walk after his commandments. So, you know, I guess to un unmarried girls, you know, I don't know, I mean, there's only a couple of you guys here that are probably of age, but you don't want to buy, you don't want to buy into this lie, right, that if you really, if you really, you know, girls buy into this lie, that if the guy, if you really love the guy, then you'll let him touch you, you'll sleep with him, you'll let, you'll kiss him, and do all these sorts of things, and, and you know, boys might use that lie, they might try and deceive a girl by going, well, if you really love me, then you would want to do this, you would want to do that, you would let me touch you there, and whatnot. You know, shame on them for thinking that and trying to deceive girls into giving away their purity for free. And, and, and I mean, shame on girls for, for doing that. Like, if, you, if you're going to give away your purity to some guy that's not even willing to commit to you, I mean, you're taking away the only incentive for a guy to get serious about this relationship. I mean, you know, how many times are girls and guys dating? And girls are like, I don't know when he's going to pop the question. I don't know when he's going to get serious about the relationship. Well, while you're fornicating and letting him touch you and letting him and kissing him and hugging him, you're taking away the only incentive he has to actually think, well, if I really want to get this girl, I've got to be serious. So don't do that. You know, my mom, you know, my mom would always say, I know it doesn't sound like good, you know, but why buy the cow? If you can get the milk for free, right? So it's like it's just it's just a reality of life. Why would you want to pay for something when they're already giving it to you for free? So don't do that. Don't be unwise. And 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 guys, you know, I've been a young guy before. I know exactly how these little weasels think. So you know, just uh, you know, just just keep that in mind. You know, they 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 know how to to to, to charm and talk, but. You know, they're, they're after a couple of things. And, and this is how you can test whether they really love you. Because if they love you, like I said, the Bible says, this is love, that we walk after his commandments. If a boy really loves you, he's going to take the necessary steps, right? To actually go about trying to get married to you so that he doesn't steal something from you that doesn't belong to him. So love is not just sexual desire, right? Even though sexual desire is part of loving your spouse, right? Part of love. It's not only sexual desire. So you can see here that there's a right and a wrong. Now what's another one? Love is not just emotion, is it? So let's go to Psalms 5, because there is emotion in love. 
Um, let's go here to five song. Let me see if I can get here. Song four. <coughs> there can be very strong emotion in love. And, and love is often emotional and, and it's intensified by intimacy. This is why if you are not sure whether or not you want to marry a person, it's, re it's a really bad idea to be physically intimate. Because physical intimacy and emotional attachment, these go hand in hand. The more you are intimate with somebody, the more emotionally attached you are to them. And the more you, you, you are physically intimate, the harder it is to break that emotional attachment when you realize this person is not the right person you should be marrying. It says, my beloved put his hand uh, put in his hand by the hole of the door. My bowels were moved for him. I rose up to open to my beloved and my hands dropped with myrrh. My fingers with sweet smelling myrrh upon the handles of the lock. I opened to my beloved and my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul failed when he spake. I sought him but I could not find him. I called him but he gave me no answer. So this is somebody that's seeking her spouse, right? A lady. The watchmen that went about the city found me. They smote me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took away my veil from me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him that I am sick of love. So you heard the phrase, you know, to be, to be lovesick. You know, that's, that's biblical. You know, biblical, they're, they're so in love. You know, you have such an emotional a desire and attachment to somebody that, that it actually makes you feel unwell. You know, I'm sick of love. So this is obviously songs where, you know, a spouse, two spouses, you know, a, a lady and her, and her husband uh, are, are desiring one another. <laughs> so love is not just emotion, right? <coughs> but love is, love is often emotional. And it's, it's intensified by intimacy. But the difference is, is that love puts purpose before emotion, right? Love, love puts a purpose before emotion. It's, it's, it's a reason for why we are doing these things and a goal before the emotion. The emotion follows. But love is not emotion before purpose. And this is often the problem with dating couples, right? Where they are intimate, they're emotional, but they're not actually moving forward in purpose, right? Actually figuring out whether they should be getting married, whether this is a, a marriage that is going to work, you know, they have the same goals and, and all those sorts of things. So when it comes to unmarried people, you know, you want to discuss your philosophy, you want to discuss future plans before becoming too emotionally attached. Because what you'll find, and I've seen so many people get into this trap, is that they, they, they start dating somebody, now they're boyfriend and girlfriend, now they're physically intimate, and then the person's not even saved. Or the person doesn't even like, you know, they, 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 they don't even want anything to do with their religion. But because they're so emotionally attached, they don't have the boldness, they don't have the guts to break off that relationship now. And you know, they've been dating for three, four, five years, so then they marry just out of convenience. Right? They put the emotion before the purpose, because the purpose of your marriage ought to be to serve God. But the same with, with married people, right? Because whilst unmarried people, they struggle with having a lot of emotion, what do unmarried people struggle with? Not having enough emotion. So they start thinking, well, if you buy into the, con uh, the misconception that love is just this emotion, then when you're married and the emotion is no longer there, it's like, well, are we no longer in love? Are we, no, are we no longer loving one another because the emotion is not there? No, no. So you have to still continue to nurture your relationship. You need to still communicate well. You need to still serve your spouse even when that emotion is gone. Why? Because this is love that we walk after His commandments, right? You, you actually, you love is the doing of God's commandments. It's not just the emotion, even though emotion is part of it. Now what's the next one? Love is not just peace. Now obviously there are different types of peace, right? There's, there's, there's the right sort of peace, which is that you actually have peace through unity, peace through resolving conflict. But then sometimes there is just peace that is just the absence of conflict. Now that's not what you want to be aiming for when it comes to love. But some people think love is just peace at all costs. And even though there is conflict, they would rather just, you know, go away. They don't want to cause any trouble. Right? They, don't want to, they don't have the guts to tell their wife that she's spending too much money or they don't have the guts to tell their wife that she's doing something wrong or stop telling me what to do because it, they'd rather just be, you know, like they sneak out with their mates, right? Because they, they're, they're, they're too much of a coward to confront their wife, their overbearing wife. They, they, they can't go out with their friends. They have to hide it from their wife. But they'd rather do that. Why? Because they don't want the trouble. 
right? See, this is not loving just because there's peace in the home. You want peace through unity, peace through resolution of conflict, not just peace through the absence of conflict. And we don't want to buy, you know, you don't want to buy into this fantasy Hollywood style of love where there just nothing goes wrong. That's not reality. You know, the reality of love and reality of relationships, any relationship, because it involves two sinners, is that there will be conflict. There will be things that need to be worked through. There will be strife. There will be trouble. So you need to learn how to cope with conflict, how to resolve conflict, not just how to best avoid conflict. You know, avoid conflict, have separate bank accounts. Avoid conflict, have Facebook accounts separate and don't be friends, you know, so that they don't see. Just that's, that's not how you, you love, right? You love by resolving conflict. So don't follow, don't fall into this fantasy notion of love that there is no conflict. If we look at the, uh, <coughs> I guess, the, the quintessential passage of love, which is 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, Look at what it says here. I mean, the first few words in 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Charity suffereth long. Now, if love was just peace and quiet, no trouble at all, just like you see in the movies, what are we suffering in charity? What is charity suffering? Suffering long, right? It's not just suffering short, suffering long. And it's kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not our own, is not selfish, not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoices, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. So you see, if there isn't conflict, it's probably not love there, right? Because you're probably not spending a lot of time together or not talking to each other or not, don't really have much to do with each other's lives. That's how you can avoid conflict. But if you want to love and keep God's commandments, you need to know how to endure conflict, resolve conflict. So you want peace through unity rather than peace through absence of conflict. Uh, look at this verse here in James 3, <coughs> 13. The Bible says here, Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. All right, so we want to be wise. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. Right? For where envying and strife is, so where is this envy and strife? Verse 14, it's in your heart, isn't it? So it's not necessarily something that comes out, but it's something that's there, but it's just not being resolved. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. <coughs> but the wisdom that is from above, look at this, is first pure, then peaceable. See, so it's not peace at all costs. No, it's peace through purity, right? Peace through unity and resolution. You want to first have a relationship where you're unified, Right? And, and obviously I'm applying it to spouses, but you know, with anything, when it comes to good relationships, you want a good relationship, you want a relationship where you have unity, where it's first pure, then peaceable. Because if it's not, then what often happens is you have this envying and strife that is in the heart, right? But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. Why? Because you think you have peace, but there really isn't peace there. Gentle and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. So you see how peace, again, love, it's not just something that happens. This is love, that we walk after His commandments. It's something that we have to do. Peace doesn't just happen. True peace, right? Peace through resolution. Peace through unity doesn't just happen. It requires communication. It requires a bit of meekness. It requires repentance in the sense that, you know, if you do something wrong, you, you need to be willing to say sorry, right? Repentance from doing what was wrong. If you wrong somebody, right? You come to them. You ask forgiveness. It requires being willing to forgive, right? If somebody says sorry to you, are you willing to forgive them? You know, the Bible says, you know, uh, what was it? So, so, uh, one of the apostles uh, asked Jesus, 
how many times should I forgive my brother? You know, till seven, till seven times? And he says, until 70 times seven. All right? So this is love, that we walk after his commandments. All right? So it's not just the fact that there's peace. There's a good, right peace and there's a wrong peace. Let's look at another one. Now, love is, is not just the giving of gifts. It's not just the giving of gifts, even though giving gifts is part of love. It's not just giving gifts, because you can give gifts the right way, and you can give gifts the wrong way. Now, obviously, God is the ultimate gift giver, right? He gave His only begotten Son. James here says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So there's nothing wrong, obviously, with giving gifts. God gives us gifts. God is the ultimate gift giver. But see, love is not just unbridled giving. Because some people think, well, I love my children, I love my spouse, so I'm just going to give them whatever they want. But God doesn't give, us, doesn't give to us like that, does He? Let's look in James 4, <coughs> verse 2. Look at this. You lust, right? You desire. <coughs> and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. So love is not just unbridled giving. right? It's not just like I love my kids so much so that I'm just going to give them everything. I just give them a car. I give them, I pay for everything. I pay for all their clothes. I pay for their new you know, Air Jordans. I pay for you know, everything. No, that's not love. Love is not unbridled giving. Love gives to be a blessing. But sometimes too much giving, unbridled giving, can actually be a curse on somebody, right? Whether you're not actually teaching them how to, to earn things, how to, how to be content, right? Sometimes you have to deny children things because they have to learn to be happy with what they have, right? Don't just give children everything they want. Yeah, I'm sure if you gave children everything they want, like my kids, man, they want ice cream every day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, right? But they can't have ice cream every day. Right? And when I give them ice cream, I don't just give them, I don't let them dish out their own ice cream. Right? Like I tell them how much ice cream they're going to have because I'm giving it to them to be a blessing. I don't want them to be fat and obese right? and get bad habits about how to eat. You know, get their palate too used to things that are sweet so that they struggle with getting off the sweets when they're old. They struggle getting off the sugar when they're older. So sometimes you have to give them things they don't want, right? Like we give them vegetables. We know, we know that love is not just unbridled giving, right? But, you know, it's the same with your spouse. You know, when it comes to just giving gifts, eating out all the time, having fun, going on holidays, you know, your wife comes to you, oh, I'm so tired, we need a vacation. So you give them a vacation. No, because sometimes there are better things to spend that money on, especially younger couples. You know, you sh shouldn't be just spending your money going out to eat, celebrating every single holiday, every Valentine's Day, right? You can. All these, when you've got things to pay for, you've got bills, you know, you've got, you've got to save some money because you're going to have children. If you've got a mortgage you need to pay for, money needs to be going into that mortgage. Some of you have student loans you need to pay off. You need, you need to pay for these things rather than just you know I love them so much that's why I've got to take them out I've got to drive here and drive them there and take them to this and do this and, and do that no no love isn't just this unbridled giving right there's 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 a there's limitations you need to think about doing right by the person right this is love if you're gonna love our neighbor as ourselves we got to keep God's commandments part of it is being a good steward right and same with kids you know I think we ought to teach our kids <coughs> to work. You know, and that's one thing I do, like I, I actually started, that's what's funny, it's just fresh on my mind, right? I started, I, I gave my kids like each of these, these little boxes and I labeled on them. So each of them have four boxes. And one is give, so that's what they're going to give to church, they're going to give to God. One of them is spend, one of them is save, if they want to save for something bigger, and then one of them is invest. So I've always had this idea in my head and, and my, my kids are now just starting to get to the age where they understand the value of money. They understand that if they do a task, they're going to get paid for that task. And it, I can start to, start, to, start to see it working where they're actually fighting over who's going to fold that bucket of clothes because whoever folds that bucket of clothes is going to get paid. So I like that system. I always sort of thought, hey, you know, one day I'm going to have this system in my house. It's going to be like free market capitalism. I'm going to set some prices. I've got a price list on the wall. You know, folding clothes is one dollar. You know, clearing the table, 50 cents. So I'm just starting to do that with my kids and hopefully it works and then what we're, what we're planning to do is every month 
we, we're going to go to the shops so then they have their money that they can spend, but also pick out something that they want to save for, and then the invest money is going to be put away to invest, <coughs> and then a percentage obviously is going to be uh, given to God. So then every month we'll see how much they've earned, you know, so, so the jobs are just, obviously Simon's the one that can do most of the jobs right now. Sarah and Timothy help out a bit. But hopefully as, as they get older, I can give them bigger jobs, you know, maybe like mowing the lawn and things like that. But right now it's just, you know, folding clothes, you know, it's, it's clearing the table, you know, maybe sorting clothes. But it, it's amazing how much these little jobs just help. Now, now instead of Elizabeth having to sit there for half an hour and sorting out these costs, we can give it to the kids to do. Right? And, and teach them that they need to work to earn money, and they need to work. Rather than me just buying them toys all the time, now I can say, well, if you want to buy that toy, do some work, save some money, and then we can take you to the shops, you can buy that toy. You know, you can teach them a bit about earning their rewards as opposed to just, you know, expecting to, to get a free handout all the time. Uh, so, you know, part of love is being a good steward, isn't it? And why is that? Because, you know, what, this is love that we walk after His commandments. <coughs> now one last one I want to cover is, now love is not just serving, right? Like, uh, and it might be a bit counterintuitive because you go, isn't love like serving somebody else? Well, no, because just like with giving, you know, unbridled serving to somebody, it's, it's the same problem. Like when you do something for somebody all the time, right? Uh, and you don't let them do it for themselves. But obviously part of love is serving one another. Uh, and we can go here to Galatians 5 verse 13. This is probably the best verse I could find uh, on, on this particular topic. For brethren, ye have not been called unto, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Look at this, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So again, tying it in there, that love is keeping God's commandments, hanging on, you know, all the prophets, on the law and the prophets is the greatest commandment to love God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. So, Love is not just doing everything for someone. And we already sort of talked about that in the sense of with kids. You know, parents, you, you don't want to just do everything for your kids. You know, you, you, you need to, like for example, I talked about sorting the clothes, and like because what will happen in what we're doing right now. And it's funny because when I take some time off work, and my wife always knows this, I take some time, when, whenever the next baby comes around, that's when like I'm doing a lot of the housework for a week or so. So then I sort of see how the house is happening and what the kids are doing, and then I start trying to put some systems in place. So, so one thing I realized is, hey, you know, my kids are old enough to know whose clothes are whose clothes. So, well, you know, why, why does Elizabeth have to sort the clothes after they come out of the dryer? Like, like, take them out of the dryer, one of the kids can sort the clothes. So what we did is I, I gave everyone a bucket, and then, you know, one child can get 50 cents, you know, depending on how big the bucket is, to sort the clothes into all the different buckets. So then one child knows, oh, these are Abel's clothes, these are Sarah's clothes, and then they sort them out. And then do I, or do I get Elizabeth to go put those clothes away? No! I get them to go put their own clothes away because they know where their pants go, they know where their undies go, they know where the socks go. They know how, like, I don't, we don't do all this for them, right? We tell to teach the kids to be a bit independent, you know, and, but I'll go check, you know, because if I go to their room and they've just dumped all the, you know, all their clothes into the drawer, then I, we'll correct them, right? We'll say, hey, no, you've got to take them out and fold them. So this idea of where people get this idea that it's just, I love my kids so much, I'm just going to do everything for them cook for them, clean for them. It's like, no, 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 let me get that. No, I'll get the plate because I love my children so much. No, you don't love your children so much if you're just doing everything for them. Because part of loving your children is teaching them how to be responsible, teaching them to work, right? Teaching them to earn a living. And we want our children to become independent. This is why people grow up, they can't do anything. You know, guys grow up, don't even know how to wash dishes. I mean, come on, like, you, you need to know how to wash dishes, you need to know how to vacuum a floor, you need to know how to sweep a floor, you need to know how to wipe a table down. But it's, it's, it's children that have grown up in households where mum does everything, but they don't know how to do these things, right? So that's what I'm saying. Love is not just doing everything for somebody, even though love includes serving one another, but we need to keep God's commandments in mind, our responsibilities, doing what's best for the person, teaching them to be responsible. <coughs> So love does what is right, not just what's convenient for the person, not just what's easy for them. 
Now, part of serving somebody else and loving other people, right, and being, being, being loving, is your example as well. To be a good example. So, love, love is not being so busy where God is being neglected, right? So sometimes people say, you know, I, I love, but I love my partner so much, I love my spouse so much, and we spend every weekend together, I'm taking her out, but you're never at church. You're not loving. Why? Because this is love, that we walk after His commandments. It's, your example is part of how you love too. Same with your children, same with your spouse. We need to set the example that God comes first. But if you're setting the example, no, family comes first. Right? I, I, you know, I, it's only, I only go to church because there's, not fa there's nothing with family on, right? What do you teach? What's your example? What are you serving? What's the example you're serving to your family, to your spouse? That family is more important than God, right? So it's the same with these things. It's not just about ser it's serving. It's part of your example as well. And, you know, you, you, you don't, you're not loving your family. You're not loving your spouse or your children when you're so busy that God is neglected. Because part of loving them is having that good example. Why? Because this is love. That we walk after His commandments. So think about your example. Think about your lifestyle. Right? Your example where, you know, you go to church and everything's, you know, hey brother, everything's right, talking the right way, but you go home and it's F this, F that, oh S this, F that, you know. Oh, you know, you, you, you're at church, you're talking about God, but then at home you never talk about God. Never talk about the Bible. Like the, the word Jesus never even crosses the table. You know, you're at church, you pray at church, but you go home, but the, you, you, know, you never pray as a family. You never pray before you, you never pray before you go to bed. N nothing like that. So think about your example. This is how you love and serve your family when you keep God's commandments. Now that's the last one I have, so I, I know you could probably think of many other different examples when it comes to love, but the main point I wanted to just come across with today is obviously there are misconceptions out there about what love is, you know, and they're not entirely wrong because love includes the emotion, it includes the sexual desire, it includes the giving, the serving, but it's not just those things. Right? Love is keeping the commandments of God. And if we focus on obeying God and keeping His commandments, then we'll love in the right way. We'll actually do what's right by somebody as opposed to just buying into this idea that just serving and just giving alone is, is loving. So you need to know the Bible. You need to know the commandments, right? So you can discern between what love is and what love isn't. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord, uh, for your word. Um, thank you, Lord, that you ultimately are the greatest example of love. We just need to follow in your footsteps. And um, we pray, Lord, that you'd help us to do that. None of us have arrived. Um, pray, Lord, that you'd help us to love more and more. And what does that mean, Lord? We learned today that love is to keep your commandments. That's how we're going to love you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And how we're going to love our neighbor as ourselves. <coughs> I pray, Lord, that we would reflect on your word, reflect on what is right when we love and not just what the other person wants. So help us, Lord. Give us wisdom. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.